This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Yeah, we're going to put Night Null on an anvil and beat it up. But first, for the past two years, these shoes and this bow have been hidden in all of my YouTube videos, including this one. I'll show you where at the end if you want to check your work. So take a look back and see if you can spot them. I've been asked to make a knife out of Night Null by Rick Schultz, who sent me two rarefied pieces of the metal. Rick founded Mission Knives, who decades ago famously supplied knives and EOD equipment made of what they called beta titanium to the U.S. Navy SEALs and other military branches. He sent me these samples given to him a long time ago by the old Navy OD Tech Center. The Night Null project director at that time told Rick it was the only material that could withstand the internal stresses of a rocket motor. It's a unique metal made from nickel and titanium, and its unique properties were uncovered by the U.S. Navy in 1959. Night null is known as a shape memory metal because it can reversibly change shapes when the metal is heated and cooled to move between its two crystalline forms, austenite and martensite. The problem is our night null looks like this. It's not a size or shape I can use, so it has to be forged, and actually it has to be hot rolled, really, into a flat sheet, but that is prohibitively expensive. Rick passed this stuff on from the Navy. Let's take a look at it. Hot form or press at 1650 degrees, up to 30,000 of oxidation per side after forming and heat treatment. That's like a 16th of an inch. Rapid cooling is required to harden night and all with over 55% nickel. Quench from about 1900 degrees Fahrenheit and two hot water for 61 HRC. Tempering night and all at low and very high temperatures produces similar results, but intermediate temperatures soften the metal too much. Here's what else I learned from reading other sources. Night null is rolled out or extruded at 1,475 degrees when the alloy is easily workable but not prone to oxidation. Again, this oxidation thing keeps coming up. Cold working is difficult due to work hardening. Machining, such as milling, turning, grinding, sawing, and water jetting and drilling, can be accomplished, but carbide tooling and a chlorinated lubricant is recommended. It takes a CO2 laser with inert gas to weld it to itself and percussive arc welding to put it to stainless. About 10 years ago, a company named Summit Materials began using powder metallurgy to make 60% nickel, 40% titanium, a product they called SM100, marketed for knife making. That company was sold to Purist Metals, who made titanium powders and spheres, which was acquired by Carpenter, who allegedly doesn't make SM100 anymore. So there's not a great deal of SM100 left, but this place called Specialty Metals has a small selection for anyone interested. It's very, very expensive. And this is their website. According to their data sheet, it's non-magnetic, very highly corrosion resistant, and weighs slightly less than 440C stainless. They recommend quenching from about 1800 degrees into oil or between plates after a 20 minute soak. How do they say it's edge retention and toughness stack up to ferrous knife steels? I mean, not so good, basically, <laughs> you know, when I look at it. It has a clear advantage in corrosion resistance and that's about it. Okay, there's the boring stuff. Now, I have not found anyone who has tried to forge this stuff, and according to Rick, these specimens are flat-out original gangsters. So I'll need to cut off a few small pieces to test their properties before committing to a piece large enough to actually make a knife out of. I'm sort of in over my head, and I have some predictions. Number one, it's going to take three times as many saw blades as normal. Number two, it's going to take three times as much grit as normal. Number four, I'm not going to be able to heat treat it correctly. I'm going to send it off to have it professionally heat treated. Number four, something's going to catch on fire or explode. Number five, I'm going to have to forge it in a can to keep it from oxidizing. Number six, this isn't going to work. Check out this rough and tumble wood carving knife I made. Its inspiration came from Skillshare. Skillshare is an online community for doers and makers of all ability levels. Millions of people find information and classes on crafting, music, film, content creation, and much more. This knife came out of a video I found on carving knot work into wood. The instructor clearly laid out all the materials and tools needed, then walked through the project step by step. I didn't have a wood carving knife like the one he uses, so I decided to forge one and carve the knots into its handle. Let's take a quick peek at making the knife using the carving techniques I learned on Skillshare. You guys, Skillshare has no advertisements. For less than $10 per month with a one-year subscription, you get access to professional quality instructional videos that can fill up a Saturday afternoon with your kids or loved one, or maybe you can find content that will give you a leg up at work. Skillshare has what you need to start your creative journey. The first 1,000 subscribers to click the link in the description below will get a free trial of a premium membership. 
Go check out Skillshare right now. Okay, different piece. Check the method. We're going to anneal it. I looked up that information on temperatures. We're going to see if we can soften it and then cut it. All right, fine. We'll get out the angle grinder. So this took two and a half metal cutoff wheels to cut off this small piece. Well, using tongs is going to suck too much heat out of the piece while we're trying to forge it. So I know there's no chance of getting a quality weld here based on what we've read, but I just need something that'll hang on long enough to run this through the press to draw it out a few times. Yeah, guess what happens when I dropped it? It shattered like glass. Check this out. This is the point where it occurs to me I'm in pretty deep. We're going to use the instructions Rick sent and shoot for hot working the steel around 1650 degrees. Getting the forge to that temperature is an imprecise operation, but we'll get pretty close. While our night nozzle is approaching temperature, I'm going to warm the drawing dies with this piece of hot steel. This will be done before each work session with the night nozzle. We're going to aim to bring the night null to about 50 degrees over our actual gold temperature, counting on some environmental loss. Remember, the material can allegedly be hot worked down to about 1400 degrees. I'm very curious as to why the front half cracked more than the back half. And look at all that oxidation, all that yellow stuff. That's off of one heat. It's amazing. So I'm going to try forging on the anvil a little bit, and it's going to crack up along the lines that we sort of previously put in there. My sense is that I didn't form any new cracks on the anvil, but it didn't move at all. It's like hitting a cold metal. I'm going to try forging at slightly cooler temperatures just to see what happens. Maybe avoid some oxidation. It's still breaking up along previous cracks. And at this point, I'm just putting marks in my anvil. I'm going to try a smaller drawing die at a lower temperature, closer to around 1400 degrees. And it looks like it sort of draws out okay, even as it gets a little cooler. But once I go to flat end, it just starts to crack. Look what it did to my die. It's got some really interesting large crystals and colorful low temperature oxides. Here's a theory. It may be that the surface is cooling rapidly enough under the dies to harden then crack with continued pressure, even though the dies are warm. So I'm going to cut off another piece with Rick's permission, and this time we're going to encapsulate it in steel to help it stay warm longer and we can prevent some oxide formation. I'm going to start by heating this in the forge where it comes up to temperature much quicker. I'm going to finish it in the oven where we can precisely control its temperature after a period of equalization, 1650 degrees. And yes, the dyes have been warmed.
As you can see, if we're quick with it under the dies, it doesn't really lose that much heat. While I was forging it, I felt a little, like, I don't know how to describe, I felt a pain right here. Something right in here. A little bit worried about that. So now that we've cut it open, there's two problems. First, the billet is not as long as I thought it was after we cut the ends off. I need seven inches and we've got about six and a quarter of usable steel here, maybe six and a half. So I'm gonna have to draw it out longer. The next issue is that there's these wavy dimples in there that I really don't wanna to have to grind through. I think that's gonna to lead to some warping eventually. So I've marked the outside of the canister on where to compress to flatten those. We're gonna weld sides and ends back on and get it back in the forge in the oven and on the press. That is right where I felt that ting early on. Mm. And that is too bad. So we're back to about six inches. <laughs> That's a little shorter than when we started, so I'm just going to throw it back into the dies after I heat them up again. I'm going to bring it to a slightly hotter temperature this time, and we'll just see what happens. I, I have no real expectations this is going to work. I mean, look at that. Even at that hotter temperature, it didn't look like it was cooling that much, but it just cracks right up. It's amazing. Out of curiosity, I've taken a piece here that I'm going to quench in Parks 50 oil from our prescribed 1900 degrees. I want to see what happens. Maybe I couldn't even harden this to begin with. No, it's hard. It's right between 65 and 60 HRC on the files, whatever, you know, whatever that's worth as far as these files go and determining the HRC of night and all. You know, I had some luck forging it on the anvil and then it, I didn't feel like it really cracked up. So I'm gonna make it even hotter this time, take it back to the anvil and just see if it moves a little easier. And ah, I forgot that I had an oxidizing flame on my forge and it just burnt up so quick. I mean, I took my eyes off it for like 15 seconds and when I turned back around, it was just a mushroom. It was crazy. This time I'm dialing in a reducing flame, one that has more fuel to consume than oxygen available. On my forge, this flame has a blue to orange tongue and a dull hollow roar, and that's how I know it's a reducing flame. So as you can see, despite the high temperatures, it's not oxidizing this time. That means we've got all or most of the oxygen out of the forge. I dropped the piece before I had a chance to hit it, and the smaller pieces, when they hit the ground, I mean, they oxidized immediately as their surface area got larger. There's still a chunk of it lodged to the steel encapsulation thing, and I'm just going to sort of hammer it. And, you know, it seems okay. It's breaking along pre-existing cracks. I'll put it back in the forge and heat it up and see what happens. So it's not quite as hot as I wanted, but it's still breaking up along previous crack lines and barely moving under the hammer. Same problems as last time. Well, I learned that I was sort of right in some of my predictions. I don't think this could actually be forged, at least not the 58.5% stuff. Again, these things behave a lot differently, even with small changes in their formulation. So it may be that the 60 nit this block performs a little differently, but I'll never know because I'm not going to try it. This one already has sort of a crack in it, and I don't want to waste any more of Rick's valuable material experimenting with it. So, I don't know. The idea that you could forge this on an anvil, I don't think so. You'd have to use lower temperatures to prevent some oxidation, and I think it would take a very long time to move this metal in a significant way, forging it on an anvil, and you would never be confident there weren't a lot of cracks in it. I think you'd probably develop a lot of cracks eventually. So I think the best you could probably do forging this in any sense would be to put it in a canister and really go slow at higher temperatures than I used 
to draw it out with some dyes and then maybe just stock remove something from there. That would be what I would try next is uh, back in a canister, some higher temperatures and just see what happens. But again, I don't want to use any more of Rick's materials sort of experimenting in that way. So it's off to SB uh, Specialty Metals and I'll see if they'll send me something to, to try. All right, all right. I went ahead and ordered some SM100. It's not very straight, and apparently I'm not the guy to straighten this. So I'll be in touch with them a little bit and see what they can do. I don't really want to grind it flat. I'll be down to about an eighth of an inch in some spots, and I think that'll increase the amount of warping. So to be continued next time. Stay tuned. You leave me hanging, begging for more. Think that I'm addicted to this, can't resist to be a little risky and go for it cause I want you close. I'm so exposed when you're keeping me wondering, you know I'd do anything to be in your arms again. So give me a sign, give me a sign, oh give me a sign, baby give me a sign. Talking to you, talking to you, here we go again, staying up on my...